Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We are uh, the after lunch presentation, so we're going to try to keep it lively in here, uh, keep everybody focused. Um, my name is Mike Maxwell. I'm from Tableau Software. I run Tableau's national, state, and local government practice. And uh, we're here today to talk about self service business intelligence and analytics. Um, one of those innovation trends that uh, I get to see uh, across the country really reshaping how large government organizations, well actually large and small government organizations make decisions with data and really use big data to do some really great things. So um, we're gonna show you some examples today of uh, what uh, self-service is, what it looks like, and uh, but also talk about the process change and really the cultural change that can happen in an organization um, as they employ these kinds of technologies and how it really um, changes in some very positive ways how employees use data, how citizens access data and uh, ask questions of the data and get data-driven answers to that. So uh, we've got an esteemed panel here um, to my left, a uh, big group, lots of uh, knowledge and experience. and. Um, I'll start with Blake at the far end. He's, uh, he's, an, just, he's another Tableau guy like me. He's actually local to Sacramento here. Uh, does a lot of the uh, technical work with uh, many of our uh, local Sacramento-based uh, clientele. Um, Julie uh, Nagasako is with us. And uh, I'm kind of going randomly here because I, I, I got some notes late. But uh, Julie is uh, the uh, program manager uh, with the, uh, the Let's Get Healthy website. You'll see that uh, a little bit. Uh, further into the discussion today. And um, I didn't bring my glasses, so I'm not uh, reading some of the, 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 the writing that I got in this form very well. But uh, she's re I know she's really smart, and we're glad to have her here with us. Um, sorry, we got that bio a little bit late and handwritten, so that's my fault. Um, to my left here is Jan Ross. Um, Jan is uh, Deputy Treasurer and CIO at the State Treasurer's Office. She's has 20 years in California State Service, 16 years in private industry. Her entire career has been devoted to do delivering and leading IT services as a strategic component of achieving business objectives. So we're thrilled to have Jan with us today. Uh, Michael Valley is to uh, her left. Uh, he's the enterprise business architect at the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, otherwise known as OSHPED, um, a department of the California Health and Human Services Agency. He serves on behalf of CHHS as the project manager of CHHS Open Data Portal. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, working across, across 12 CHHS departments to publish data in open formats on an agency enterprise platform. He is an adjunct professor of political science at American River College. His academic research presents arguments to reform intellectual property regulation and to reimagine the public domain as knowledge commons. So uh, lots of innovative thinking there. Michael holds a bachelor's uh, degree of science in business, uh, bachelor's of science in business administration and political science from um, San Diego State University and a master of arts in government from Sacramento State. And then uh, our last panelist is uh, Brendan McGuire. And Brendan is the Vice President of uh, Solutions at, or uh, uh, just, just Vice President at Taborda. So he kind of does it all. So uh, we're glad to have him here with us today. So I thought I, I would start out today uh, with a little bit of story um, that uh, kind of frames uh, this, this whole topic of, of self-service BI and analytics. And it's a personal anecdote. Uh, it goes back 20 years, um, but 20 years ago, I was uh, one of uh, three BI managers in an organization with about 20,000 people in it. And uh, at, uh, on, on a regular basis, people would come to my office and they'd say, I've got this da big data challenge and uh, I, I need to try to understand a certain uh, pattern or a certain uh, relationship between various factors. And so we would sit down and we would uh, kind of look at their requirements and we would look at the tools that we had at our disposal to do some assessment. And I would usually talk to them in terms of months, in terms of when they would see some analytics and when, when, when they would see some visualizations around that data question that they were, they were asking. Um, 
And so those few months would go by and I would do my work and my scripting and sometimes we, we would do you know, contractors and a lot of other things like that. And, uh, and, then, and then I would finally get to the project and it would be ready and so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd call them up on the phone because this was the early 20s and we, I don't think we even used an email that, there yet. But um, so I'd get one of three responses and the first response was they had forgotten why they asked the question in the first place and weren't sure why I was calling them. Um, that was my least favorite response, um, but it had been so long. Um, the second response uh, was um, that they were eager to see the analytics and what the analytics say because they had already made the decision, the business decision, that they needed that analytics for, and they'd been crossing their fingers hoping that the, the data and the analytics actually supported the decision that they had already made. And if it supported the decision, they'd you know, run around and show it to people and be real excited about it. And if it didn't support the decision that they had made, uh, the analytics usually kind of disappeared somehow. So, um, so that was the second scenario. Um, the third one is they, they'd come up to my office, sit down in my cube. Uh, we'd get out uh, the Sharpie and inevitably they'd want to change some things and they'd, they'd maybe want to look at the data from a little bit different perspective. Um, they'd, they'd want to have a dynamic dis discussion around, um, you know, what are we really now trying to derive from this analysis and these data and, um, and, and create a story that's going to be meaningful to a decision that's going to be made. And so we would have that discussion and uh, we'd, you know, mark up the, uh, the document. It was usually, it was, uh, you use some analytics on a, from a dot matrix printer because this was 20 plus years ago. And, um, and then uh, we would talk in terms of weeks and months as to when the next iteration of this dashboard or this data or these visualizations or these analytics would be available for them and uh, they would leave my office disappointed wishing that that could all happen a lot faster. Um, so the interesting thing about the, the business intelligence world, the visualization world is up until three or four years ago, that paradigm really didn't change very much and in fact I would suspect there are probably a number of you here in the room today that still live in that paradigm. We call that the report factory paradigm. That you really become very dependent on this IT knowledge worker who usually doesn't understand the, very well the particular line of business that they're working to support analytics for, but, uh, but their job, because the technology is so difficult and is so complex to run analytics that uh, you've got to have a specialist do that um, for you. So, um, so the good news is that uh, Newer technology is changing that, and it's generally uh, called uh, self-service analytics, self-service business intelligence. Um, I represent Tableau, one of the pioneers in that area. Um, we're not the only player in this space, but we think it's a great topic to talk about because it really does transform the way organizations, uh, we see them operate and work and how they get to decisions. So um, we're going to do a little exercise here. Um, again, make sure everybody's awake. So uh, I've got a table of numbers here up on the screen. And this table of numbers, pretty simple. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a dimension, there's a, there's a measure, um, fairly simple set of numbers. Um, so I'm going to ask all of you to do a little exercise uh, with the, the person in the chair next to you. We're going to pause for exactly one minute. And I'd like you to talk to them about um, exactly what, to, what kind of visualization would be most useful to tell the story that's in this data. And I'm going to uh, start my clock, and you can turn to the person next to you, and uh, and and you can uh, figure out what that is. So the clock's ticking, and I'm going to pause while you, you you talk to the person next to you in your seat. Okay, I I, I can hear we, we we hit a minute, and um, the, the I could hear the volume in the room started to drop after about a minute. I think that means everybody probably came to the, the, the same conclusion as to what the right way was to tell the story that's behind this data. Um, anybody want to tell us what the, the right way is for that? Everybody's kind of chuckling. There, somebody actually raised their hand back there. He's going to tell us. We, we actually thought there wasn't enough information to choose a chart. <laughs> wasn't enough information to choose a chart. Okay. We could come up with a bar graph and say, but is it comparing A to B? What is the information? So we, we want to know a little more information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's there's numbers there, but what's behind them? There was there was another raised hand. Well, I would pick bar chart because this to me, because I work in the financial world, says budget expenditure. Okay, bar chart. Is bar chart the right one? 
Everybody agree with bar chart? No, no, no. Okay, so uh, obviously, uh, you know, a little, little bit rhetorical there. Um, really, the, the, you know, the answer is um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to tell the story because the, the story um, isn't just exclusively inside of the data, but it's really uh, what, uh, where the data came from, what it's intended to be used for, uh, what that data is all about. And, um, and, this, and this kind of is the essence when we start to talk about um, self-service business intelligence analytics. Um, you get a data set, and um, sometimes you're not really even sure what question to ask of the data. Um, you want to explore it. You want to try it uh, very, very dynamically, very nimbly, different charts, look at it from different perspectives, um, challenge it with questions, and, and really try to discover what's there. Um, so that dynamic process um, can be, um, become very elongated in what I will call the traditional BI style. The, that process that I described earlier when I was a, a, you know, a, a BI analyst in the IT department, you know, people would come to me, I didn't really understand their business problem. Um, I, I, sometimes I, some departments I understood better than others. Um, but they would come and there would be this very elongated process of uh, trying to, to create the right data analytics. And inevitably, it was always not quite right. And there was always, and, and even if it was, then there would be additional insights that uh, they would want to incorporate into that. So when we talk about self-service analytics, um, we're really talking about um, solutions that make this a very dynamic process to where um, that bottleneck that I was, that you know, report factory that I was, uh, that uh, knew how to use the business analytics tool but really didn't understand the business problem in most cases, didn't understand it very well, that, uh, that we can break that paradigm and really get to a paradigm where the person that has the line of business knowledge has tools in their hands that are powerful enough and easy enough to use and simple enough to use that they can ask questions of the data directly and collaborate with their peers in terms of coming to uh, not just asking the right questions but coming to answers. Um, there are still a lot of report factories out there. Some of them are, are built within the IT departments of some of our organizations or elsewhere. Some of them are outsourced to third parties because sometimes third parties want to convince us that they understand our business better than we do. Um, that's always a bit of a head scratcher to me, but uh, some of them make that case pretty strongly. We've got really smart people. We understand uh, your agency's business better than you do, and we'll, we'll tell you what your analytics should be. That's, that's, that's um, probably not ideal if you can uh, have an alternative to that, which is really arming your organization with a tool that makes it really simple enough and easy enough for those people in the organization that, that do the knowledge work to ask a lot of these questions themselves. So I'm um, going to show you a couple of examples of this, and then uh, we're going to have some discussion around how this can apply uh, to open data and to other kinds of uh, data uh, challenges that are out there, uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, it's you know it's really about how do we make this a very accessible process for people in the organization and put, and, and and not having to go to that um, IT department bottleneck, if you will, that I once was, um, and and do that more robustly. So with that, Blake, um, we'll let you come and uh, show us a few examples. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. All right, guys. Hey, guys. Blake Hughes, Taplo, technical uh, consultant. So my goal today is to talk about two main use cases for business analytics, and that is, one, just simply augmenting your own website for public users or internal users, just kind of augmenting with, uh, with nice visualizations. And secondly, uh, empowering your users to answer questions themselves with a quick self-service analytics, you know, ad hoc kind of environment. So I need to apologize first. I was not brave enough to show a live demo because of the very weak Wi-Fi in this building. So I did a little recording to, to show this. So first thing I'm going to show is uh, Let's Get Healthy California. This is a HHS program to, uh, in the next, like, uh, I don't know, eight, ten years, to increase the health of Californians to, to be the best, most healthy state in the, in the country. How they did that was coming up with these 39 indicators, 39 ways of measuring the health of Californians, and grouping those indicators into six goals. So here's a little video of this website. This was, it went live about uh, a week and a half ago, so it's a brand new website. So very uh, you know, colorful, interactive way of presenting uh, these metrics to the, to the public. The target is the public. It's everyone in the state of California. 
you know, broke, broken up into these six areas or these six goals. Each one of these goals has between you know, five and 10-ish uh, metrics or, or indicators. And here's a list of those, infant, infant mortality, adult obes obesity, diabetes prevention. So this is the uh, reducing adult obesity uh, goal, or I'm sorry, indicator. Uh, where are we today? 27%. Where we were a few years ago? 22%. History, some facts, some how to learn more. Then down below is the first uh, real, real visual you see. It's interactive. I can see uh, obesity by race, by ethnicity, by age, broken down by these various uh, dimensions. I can interact with it. It's not just static. I can choose uh, my own local. I live in Elroy County. So here's the numbers for my own county. So it's very easy for the public to navigate to find you know, what's pertinent to them. Top part, your traditional bar chart. You know, the bottom part is, let's show you those same metrics on, on a map. Mapping is very, very easy to use uh, to, to add to a website like this. OK, so, so now what if, uh, what if my question, you know, I have a question. So this is good information, but what if my, my question isn't answered by this website? What if I have a different question that's not addressed here? So, so, so secondly, my question is about, um, so one of Oshped's charters is to manage the seismic health, the, the building health of their hospital infrastructure. You know, if a building falls down in an earthquake, it can't you know, fix the people that got hurt in that, in that earthquake. So, big challenge there. So I have a question, what's my exposure to earthquakes and how ready are my hospitals to withstand those and still help guests, so help the public after an, an incident? So now I notice at the very bottom of this Let's Get Healthy website, there's a get data option. This is a link to the uh, open data initiative. So first off, here's the Oshped site on uh, the seismic performance rating. Just a website describing what this is, describing the problem, how they rank or rate each uh, facility. And now I want to go grab some data. So I'm going to go to the HHS open data portal. And I see categories like healthcare, workforce, environment. I'm going to focus on the facilities kind of category. And here at the top, this top example is the raw data set for all these facilities in California and their, 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 their ratings. So here I see the raw data, again, on the open data portal. I see facility name, building number, rating, location, XY coordinates, the Latin long coordinate of all the facilities. But this is just raw data. How I, how I want to touch it is I need to get it off, off this site by exporting it to, to, to Excel or a, a, a data file. Or there's this great option of, uh, of, open, of uh, OData. OData is a web service. So I can connect to this open data portal and direct kind of server to server connectivity, direct connection to that, this, this data set. Once I have the data, once I've grabbed this data, now I want to use this thick client tool, Tableau Desktop, to visualize this data. So on the left-hand side, I see all my dimensions, my location, my facility name, my, my county code. I'm just going to start creating a map. Where are these facilities? Just a couple clicks, here's my map of California with all the locations. I want to color code by rating. Ratings are one through five. One being bad, five being better. I want to tidy up the map a little bit. The maps are very configurable. I want to turn on, uh, like, we'll first make it a little bit darker so you can see a little, a little bit better. Turn on place names and roads and highways and county borders and county names. Just make it look a little bit better. Yep, so it's looking look, look, look good now. Now let's leave this alone and go to my uh, raw data. County by county, how many hospitals are, in, are, are, are ranked one, or two, or three, or four? What's my exposure? Let's just drag and drop this data onto my palette. On the right-hand side, I see this little box where I can quickly choose what, visual, how, what uh, type of visual I want to display this data in. A tree map. A bubble chart, kind of a popular thing these days. This is just a, a, a small, small, small subset of all the visuals you can make with uh, just one click with, with this tool. So I'm, I'm going to choose a, a bar chart for now, sort it by, by a number of records. So obviously, Los Angeles County has the most hospitals. I want to color code this by the rating, the SPC rating. 
I want to you know, make it look a little, a little bit better, add some borders to it so the colors kind of pop out more. How's it look on the projector? Pretty legible. So I still want to, you know, I want to make the, uh, the, the worst numbers, the, the worst hospitals on the left-hand side. A nice little heat map, but still Los Angeles County kind of dominates this chart because it's just so big. I want to make turn this into a, a percentage-based calculation. So I want to do what's called a table calculation and show a percent of total for each county. Not on the whole data set, but per county, what's my exposure percentage-wise. And I can see, looks like I have, uh, for LA County, here's my, my, uh, my one through threes. I want to count the number of hospitals in each county, just add that to my tooltip. And I can see, you know, as an example, uh, LA County, all the hospitals with a two rating, there's 139 of those, and that is 17.6% of the total for that county, or have, have, that, have that two rating. So this is all fine. I can interact with the data here and kind of see the, my exposure to this problem. Let's just wrap it up and put it on, on a dashboard. I want to put the map and the bar chart side by side. So again, super, super easy. Just drag and drop. This is a notion of a dashboard. Spiff it up a little bit. I want to, you know, resize it and move the legend down to the bottom. Just a few quick clicks to make it look a little bit better. This is all meant for the business user to do this, by the way. This is not your IT staff doing it in some, you know, cubicle in the, in the basement. The business user is doing this themselves. I want to make my bar chart be a, a filter. So I click on, if I click on the bar chart, I want to have my map update automatically. So I'm seeing all of my you know, facilities color-coded by, by rating. Just show me my, my number one rated hospitals. With the, that's the worst rating, where they are. Pop down to Orange County. See the map immediately updates for that area. OK, so this is a useful visualization I just made. It's, it helps me answer my question, what, what's my exposure by county? Where are these things? And now I want to share this with, with someone. I'm going to publish this, this great visual to a, a website so anyone in the world or my organization can just use a web browser to go look at. So I'm going to go to uh, a, a Tableau demo server that I, I, I use. So I published this already. Now I'm going to go view it as if it were uh, just a, 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 a web-based visualization. So I have a bunch of views available here, but I found the one I'm looking for. And now I'm viewing the same, the same thing over a website. So that's, it took me about six minutes to do this demo. And it took me, I did this, this I recorded this in real, in real time. So I went from a raw data set to a pretty nice visual in just five minutes. And I spent one minute publishing it to somewhere on the web that everyone in the world can access. That's really the, the punchline here is how quick we can go from raw data to visuals just, uh, just, just that quick. So that makes, does that, uh, are there any questions about that? A little short demo vignette. If not, Mike, thank you. Okay, uh, well, thanks Blake. So uh, sure. a, a good example of a, um, a self-service process. Um, wasn't, uh, took a, a, a very uh, a large, uh, data set, important data, and with uh, a, a drag and drop interface, a tool that really anybody in this, in this room uh, could use. You know, Blake's got a little bit more experience than people in the room, so he did this in six minutes, but uh, I'd venture to say anybody in this room could uh, be doing that you know, in, a, in a fairly short amount of time. And that's really, the I think, what we see is transformational in terms of uh, taking the promise of big data to um, um, the masses. And, and if you think about not just what Blake had, cre had created, but then the dialogue and the collaboration that happens in an organization when you can create something that quickly and that easily, and then it's be able, it's got that ability to be shared electronically very dynamically. Um, really gives a very unique opportunity, unprecedented opportunity for organizations to uh, look at data from different perspectives, challenge it, ask questions of it, and um, and make better decisions with it, which is, uh, I think, the, the ultimate goal. So um, we've got uh, um, some, uh, some panelists that have also um, some content to share with us in terms of um, open data initiatives. And again, these are the kinds of things that can 
leverage, uh, you know, be available to self-service and support them. So, um, Jan, I think we've got uh, okay. you first here. So if you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Debt Watch. Thank you. So you may be wondering um, what the relationship is between the Treasurer's Office and Get Healthy California. Well, how many of you would consider yourselves healthy if your finances were totally askew and you didn't know what was going on? You might be healthy in many respects, but if your finances are totally out of control or you suddenly lost your job or somebody created identity theft and stole all your money, your health might deteriorate. Well, the treasurer has the exact same vision about California's finances. He's very concerned about our financial well-being as the state of California. And he's had a vision for open data for many years. Long before he became the treasurer, while I was at the controller's office with him, we launched three open data websites. And they're not just open data, they're transparency. And they're not just transparency, they are visualizations and self-service analytic tools. Now, how many of you are state employees? Show of hands. So most of you. So how many of you have looked on um, the SACB's website and looked up at least one person's state employee salary on SACB's database? Oh, come on, you guys. I think you've all done that. But, <laughs> but moving forward. In case you're not aware of it, the controller's office, when we were there, the first open data transparency website we launched is called publicpay.ca.gov. And that was created in the wake of the scandal in the city of Bell in 2010. You may remember some of those people are now in federal prison. But moving along, um, when that happened, and controller Chung, at that time controller, discovered that through audits, he immediately said, we are going to put all of the information of public pay into the hands of the citizens. They need to know and they need to be able to hold their elected officials and their government leaders and policymakers accountable for what is being done in their specific districts. So we compiled all of the actual public pay of everybody in the cities, the counties, the special districts, that's over 4,700 entities right there, we compiled all state employees. We did state um, fairs and expos, first five, uh, judicial, all the judges, um, anybody in any teaching capacity, K through 12, community colleges, CSUs, UCs. If you received a government-sponsored paycheck, we'll call it that, your box five data from your W-2 is recorded every single year in, on this website called publicpay.ca.gov. And it was never the Chung administration's vision to just throw a data set out there and tell everybody, go look at this data and see if you can make sense out of it. When you land on that website, you see a map of California, and it's a heat map. And so all those salaries um, show up by concentration. You can see where the greatest concentrations of those salaries are. You can see who the top 10 paid individuals are. You can do um, comparisons by uh, local entities, state entities, job um, job classifications. So while this may all be interesting for the citizens, and it was created for transparency and to hold government officials accountable, what we didn't expect was how people would begin to use this in their day-to-day -day business operations in government entities and private industry alike and become so thoroughly dependent on it. It became such a critical factor in government entities that they suspended doing salary, they suspended, what do you call them, salary studies, salary studies. When they um, are going to the bargaining table and they want to see what are all the other entities paying this classification and how should I be bargaining this, they suspended those studies and they rely exclusively on publicpay.ca.gov. We were unaware of that benefit coming out of it until they started telling us, don't ever take this down. It became so critical to them that Assemblymember Ting introduced legislation a year ago to make sure the site was never even taken down for maintenance and operations. It was to stay up 24-7 no matter what. Well, that legislation didn't pass, but it shows the dependency that people can create when they're given access to data and how critical that data becomes to making business decisions. Um, another site that we launched was called By the Numbers. We launched that in 2014. And it's a look at all of the revenues and expenses of every city, county, special districts, mosquito abatement districts, everybody out there um, who has a financial 
interest in the state of California, who's collecting taxes, who's collecting revenues, and how they're spending it. And again, the goal was transparency and accountability. And the goal was put a map out there, put tools out there so the average citizen doesn't have to dive into the data and be a data scientist, but they can actually land on the page and begin to engage with the data. And so while we put this out there for the citizens, once again, this became a cr critical decision-making tool for, in one example, the city of Sacramento. So Mayor Kevin Johnson was trying to figure out, how can I pay for a major league soccer stadium without raising taxes? I have this promise, no new taxes. But what is the hotel tax rate, it's called transient lodging tax rate, in other event cities? If we compare our hotel tax in Sacramento as an event city to other comparable event cities, is there some ability to raise that tax level and fund the Major League Soccer Stadium and a funding strategy emerged. And that's just one example of how these transparency, self-service, business analytics tools have grown into becoming a decision-making key factor for many levels of government. So this is Debt Watch. We launched this on November 17th, 2015. It's interactive, it's self-service, and it provides visualizations much like the three sites did that we launched at the controller's office. Up in the corner is a very golden, kind of goldenrod bar, and you may be thinking, what do I really care about debt? Well, it goes back to the financial being of California. When you are casting your votes in the fall or in the summertime, and there's a bond measure on there for a school or infrastructure or a new hospital, and you say, didn't we just vote 300 million in on this three years ago? What's become of that? That's where this site becomes critical. And it's critical not only to citizens, but it's critical to policymakers and other state departments. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. But that golden rod bar at the top, it's a carousel of three questions. And they're topical questions. They will change from time to time. But they're to prompt general citizens coming to our website about the kinds of information they can find on this. Like they can drill right down into their own community and find out how come schools are issuing more debt than anybody else in California. So people are unfamiliar with this data. It's been locked up in the government silos for years and years and years. And we're not only liberating it, we're trying to provide that interactive experience where ordinary citizens can come and say, gee, this is interesting. Why do I care about this? So we have three invitations to interact with the data from this homepage. The first one we call the debt wheel, and it's eight categories of people who issue debt. So it could be JPAs, Joint Powers Authorities. If you've heard of that bypass freeway they're talking about putting in from 99 to Highway 50, how many of you have heard of that? Okay, well that's a JPA that's proposing that. And that's a quasi-government entity, so they issue a lot of um, bonds, UCs issue bonds, educational entities issue bonds, cities, state, county. So you can pick on any one of those categories and drill very, very quickly, slice and dice and get visualizations of that data and I'll show you one example at the end. And then we have the map of California and the map of California is divided by counties and with your mouse you can hover over it and it's interactive and when you click on a county it, it'll show you a summary of any county's debt data as you're hovering over it. But when you click on a county, then it locks it in. And I'm gonna show you an example of that and some of the things that you can get to. And on the bottom, we have your basic data scientist fast pass into the data. That's your explore all data sets. And even below that, we have um, the elections data, exactly what was voted in, who, how many votes were yay, how many votes were nay, what bond measures passed, what bond measures didn't. So there's a wealth of easy access information there. When you click on that debt wheel, you're gonna see a summary of any category. In this particular example, counties was clicked, you see this summary, and then you see two invitations to interact with the data. You see data lens and you see compare issuers. I'm gonna come back to that at the end. This is the map of California. We've, for this example, so, so this is like, you know, Martha Bakes, when you see Martha Stewart making something and she's pulling it out from under the counter, it's all mixed up, and here it comes out of the oven all baked. That's kind of what I'm doing, but you can go back and play with this yourself. So I clicked on Sacramento County. In Sacramento County, I see all of the debt that's been issued. Now, in that debt wheel, there were eight categories of issuers. 
On the county, I see all of the debt that's issued within that county border. So it's a different view. It's not just the county that issued debt here. It's everybody inside that county border that issued debt. So there's two invitations, again, to interact with the data. There's data lens and there's compare issuers. For this example, I selected data lens. When I select data lens or you select data lens, you get 12 virtual interactive index cards, graphical views of the data. And the top one here is sale date. Every single card here is interactive and allows you quick and easy access to just drill right into that data and get some pretty spicy stuff as far as debt goes. And you should consider it spicy because it's what you guys are paying for. So I clicked my mouse on 2015 here. So I'm highlighting this is showing 30 years of debt um, issued by uh, Sacramento, within the county of Sacramento County. And I could drag that cursor and filter all the other cards by any timeline that I want on that sale date card. But for this example, I just clicked on 2015. And then because I knew where I was going with that Martha Bakes strategy, I went down to the debt purpose card. And on the debt purpose card, I selected recreation and sports facilities. And so some of you may be aware that there's a Golden One Center being built for the Kings. Right now, I just drilled into it that quickly by going from Sacramento County to the sale date card for 2015 and selecting purpose, sports, and recreation. And I can see that in 2015, we issued just short of $300 million in bonds to build the Arco Arena, Arco Arena, Golden One Arena, pardon me, Golden One, Golden One Arena, that's right down the street. And then similarly, um, the Wild Hawk Golf Course in Elk Grove, if any of you are familiar with that, they also issued a bond. And so they would have done that like a conduit agency through some entity. And in fact, this was done through a Joint Powers Authority or a JPA. And you can scroll across this data when you're live on the screen and you can see exactly who issued it and who the um, trustee was on it and who helped with that bond. It's got a lot of very salient data if you really want to see who's backing, <clears throat> excuse me, what bonds and who's involved in issuing those bonds. And in fact, who's even making money on the issuance of those bonds. So going back to that debt wheel, in this example, I selected cities. And the reason I have this up is, again, this is to drive citizens and policymakers to engage in really salient conversations. So what is hotter than the unfunded public pension debt liability that is looming out there? Almost nothing. So right now, um, we are currently debating that. And if you want to use this data, you can say, when is the last time that public pensions were rapidly expanded. Well, it was in 1999. That's when the legislation changed public pension benefits, and they enormously improved. So before we go back and see what are the funding strategies that are um, perhaps crippling our undefended liability in public pensions, you might use this site to say, I want to go back to the year 1999, which is up there in the corner. And again, this is Martha Bakes. I pre-selected what cities because I knew what was out here, but you can spend all the time you want playing with this. But I selected 1999 to 2015, and I happened to select, curiously enough, among the top three cities that have debt issued during this time frame. And uh, below this, these are just screen captures. So <clears throat> below this, on the lower left side, I can collect, select purpose. And I selected the purpose of pension obligation bonds. Excuse me, a Marco Rubio move from years past. <clears throat> so anyway, I selected um, pension obligation bonds. And as you can see, these three cities during this time frame have a lot of pension obligation bond activity. <clears throat> this is a bar chart. It goes back to Mike's question about what's the best way to look at this data. <clears throat> Maybe a bar chart's not the best way to look at this. So I can just click on line chart up in the corner, the orange bar. And when I look at a line chart, now I see this is meaningful data. In fact, there is a lot of activity immediately following 1999 to 2004. But what does this debt tell me? This is refunding for your terminology for government bond 101 terminology, refunding is refinancing. Governments refinance bonds, they call it refunding, and that's to take advantage 
of lower interest rates. So they're lessening the burden on taxpayers. There's a whole glossary on this site. There's a tutorial about how to use this site. Um, you can even recreate this exact example just by watching the tutorial. But what this tells us is that there was not new funding going on. There was just refinancing. So it may not serve to support the original hypothesis that they came to this site with. And they may need to go back and say, OK, well, if it's not the pension obligation bonds that are suffering, what are the other instabilities in our public pension funding structure that need to be addressed? So this website offers great opportunity to policymakers, other government entities, and citizens alike. That's just um, a few of the examples of what we have done with open data visualizations and tried to make it very, very easy for the citizens and anyone to engage without being technically savvy, not having to go to a public records request to find this data. It's right there self-service. Thank you. OK. Um, accessibility, simplicity, uh, very much what it's all about. So uh, let's shift gears here. And we have Michael Valley come up and talk to us a little about uh, some of the health-related initiatives around open data and, and self-service. So, Thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to go through this pretty quick to leave time for, for discussion, but I wanted to talk from a, a process point of view what uh, California Health and Human Services Agency has been doing to open up uh, our data resources. And I understand that this morning there were some great speakers talking about the vision and the promise for open data. Uh, and it's really a journey that CHHS is on the first leg of and that the Treasurer's Office, Controller's Office, and, and Let's Get Healthy uh, really represent some, some great steps in that direction. Um, and we wouldn't be able to have achieved what we have or gotten where we're at with, without some great partners um, in, in the government, in nonprofit sector, technology partners, uh, and those in the community, um, specifically the uh, civic technology groups, the, the do-gooders who use their technology skills to make the world a better place. Uh, Code for Sacramento, Hack for LA, uh, others. Um, so uh, we've learned a lot since California Health and Human Services Agency launched the Open Data Portal in November of 2014, chhs.data.ca.gov. Um, and we think there's a lot of opportunity to do more. Uh, to leverage our data assets uh, for use by the public and also internally to make better use uh, uh, of analyzing and, and reporting on the data that we have. Uh, so this is CHHS, um, 12 departments, three offices, uh, 33,000 staff, about $140 billion budget. Um, so needless to say, a complex organization. Uh, with various operating models, various cultures um, across these different organizations. Um, and what we found is that open data is much less of a thing and more of a way of doing things. Um, it's more about people and process than it is about technology. Um, and so we collect a lot of data and there's room uh, to sort of build up our data management practices and our cultures across these organizations uh, to make ourselves into more data-driven uh, organizations. Uh, so before I get into some examples, um, I guess I just uh, wanted to share um, also uh, what some of these organizations have, have done with it. Uh, these are two departments in Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, OSHPOD and Department of Healthcare Services, um, an example of self-service analytics where um, the program managers of these departments were able to embed visualizations from the open data portal with minimal or little IT investment to provide richer content and to sort of enhance their web presence. Um, and I also wanted to share quickly um, how the media has been using the data on the portal as well. In November of uh, for December of 2014, there was a measles outbreak in Southern California, um, and so a very newsworthy topic was reporting on the immunization rates uh, across the state. So using data from the open data portal, national uh, news outlets were able to pick up that data uh, and report on it. New York Times, LA Times have robust data analytics shops, and we're able to produce some really interactive uh, visualizations from that. 
Um, on the flip side, KCRA3, the local NBC affiliate, uh, was able to embed, use the self-service engine available in the portal uh, to represent that data in their story as well. Um, so another example of, of how uh, stakeholders are able to use that data um, with minimal investment. Uh, one more example I'd like to share is uh, from the civic tech community. Uh, they're using open data. Uh, these are two examples of applications uh, built uh, to show data from the Women, Infants, and Children program, WIC. Uh, the one on the uh, left is a map that shows uh, the locations of WIC uh, vendors uh, and allows uh, WIC recipients to find that in a really intuitive uh, and easy to use uh, website. Um, and that was built in partnership uh, with Code for Sacramento with the launch of the portal. And on the right, you see uh, an Android application, Sacramento County WIC, you can find in the Google Play Store, um, that was uh, built during a codeathon that CHHS uh, hosted in June uh, of 2015. Uh, so two examples uh, that show how uh, the community can use this data uh, to improve uh, health outcomes. So we have a, a, a long way to go, and uh, we think that by um, focusing on publishing data that we can make improvements up the data management stream, improve our quality, standards, how we analyze data, uh, and even collect data as well. Thanks. Okay, um, good stuff going on in healthcare. Um, related to that, I'm going to uh, call out uh, Julie and, and, and Brendan. Um, the Let's Get Healthy website that Blake demoed um, earlier was just released a few days ago. And uh, I thought maybe um, you guys give a little bit of color around the speed and agility of, of building a site like that, particularly when you talk about using and embedding self-service tools, um, how that really helped that site come to fruition quickly. Because from what I understand, there's over 60 visualizations in that site. So um, Julia, Brendan, do you want to kind of comment on the speed and agility and what you've experienced using those kinds of tools? Um, in a you know in a recent uh, project that you've implemented. Sure. So um, so let's get up the line just launched last week. So we're very much in the the early stages of our agile process. We're launched, but we know we're not done. So we're very much hoping that people are going to take a look at the site and provide feedback. Um, but we did go through a very rapid development process about six to eight months to be able to pull together the data and the structure of the site and then to be able to get visualizations up there that would be dynamic for users to be able to access. Um, so that was a very um, interesting process for us, but being able to look at the, the range of options to be able to see how to display that data and in particular looking at how we could display it in a way that was going to be engaging for a broad range of users, um, knowing that Data can be intimidating for some folks who knew we wanted to situate it in a story, make it a friendly design, something that was very accessible and attractive so that people would want to engage with that data so that it could take a more active role in helping us to advance Let's Get Healthy California, which is our state health improvement plan. We know that to be able to do that, we're not going to be able to do that in isolation as government. We need to be able to be able to bring in community partners, other organizations, the civic technology community, and for them to be able to help us develop solutions, they were going to need to have access to the data. One of the things that we emphasized was trying to make the most granular data possible available, because like in the demonstration that was shared, you want to see how's my county doing on obesity? How does my county compare with other counties? How does one population compare to another? One of the things that was really exciting during the development process is we put some of the visualizations up and some of our program team were like, is this data right? Because when you start to see a data on a map or in a bar chart broken up by strata, you start to realize there are some really significant disparities. There are some places that are doing really well and it's the power of seeing that in a visualization that actually took some of our folks back and said, are we sure we can put this up? I said, wait a minute, all this data is publicly available right now. You can search on our individual program sites and pull it up. You can run a report of it. But it's um, being able to set it in that context in a very user-friendly manner really um, makes it a very powerful tool. Yeah, and from the practitioner side, from the speed implementation, so the, the project roughly started in, in August, and as Julie's mentioned, we had phase one launch. And the original project schedule 
we were actually only going to put dynamic visualizations up for, um, I remember, like six indicators. And um, you know, because a lot of the data was available already, we could start there. And what we found was that it was actually easier to create dynamic visualizations than static, um, you know, charts and graphs. So we wound up um, implementing visualizations for the vast majority, much more than we originally expected to do. So um, that was just because of the, the speed and ease to implementation there. I guess the other fact was um, we do have a Tableau developer on staff, but because all the data was available and, and that, that speed to implementation, we actually started using business analysts to create visualizations, and that's how we were able to create you know, probably the six teams, about a six week video there. Okay, great. Well, um, I know we're probably just about to where we need to wrap this session up, um, but uh, um, any, any, maybe we can take uh, one or two um, questions from the audience of anyone that's interested. Uh, yeah. So one of the uh, things that I wanted to know was how did you guys uh, come up with ADA compliance and, So the question is ADA compliance um, on the site. So from the site standpoint itself, um, um, thanks to actually a lot of, there's a lot of really good expertise at CDPH and on um, section private compliance. We, our partner that we work with is also known with the Society of the Blind. Um, so we went in with a number of built-in plugins, like that, the website's not there anymore, but on the left-hand side there's some toggles that adjust sizing and contrast. Um, and then, of course, the standard um, alt tags, and we were running continuous accessibility tests. From the data standpoint, what we did is obviously a map could be, be challenging around that. So we put a visual description and a guide that allows people to download the data and then directs them to a um, Excel reader so that they can um, gain access to understand the data. But a lot of thought and effort, a lot of testing. And I do have to say CDPH was an excellent support and resource, resource on that. Uh, one other question. We've got to wrap up here. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, we could have probably spent all afternoon talking about uh, all this great information, but um, I think we see these solutions as, as really do, you know, bring a change in the culture of how the public, how the media, how our employees within, uh, you know, the state environment work with us, and um, it's uh, just it's very exciting to see. So thank you everyone for participating. Thank you all for joining us today.